Let's begin with a pop-up phenomenon. A pop-up is just that, a temporary exhibition space. Usually in an unused window or store, it just pops up one day, appearing almost out of nowhere. Its sudden appearance turns people's heads. The surprise is the disconnect between what we expect and what we see. Hey, where did that come from? What's that gallery doing in that old, shuttered, dry cleaner's window? The work is at the street level. It engages the passerby. No museum, no gallery, no jewelry store to create a barrier. The display is part of the urban environment. The everyday goes from the plain to the purple. Our first speaker, Natasha Granitstein, is a writer, strategic communication advisor, and community organizer. She's also the founding chair of the Danforth East Community Association, or DICA, a local Toronto organization that is currently revitalizing a main commercial strip into a more vibrant, walkable, and safe destination. DICA helped implement the pop-up movement in its East Toronto neighborhood. It is having an incredible impact on the community, offering once-in-a-lifetime chances to artists and small business owners. Natasha will share what they've learned and some examples of their success. Welcome, Natasha Granitstein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so do you guys have any idea how incredibly intimidating you are to present to? I start getting this going, and uh, I'm sitting down in front of my computer, and I'm, you know, I'm doing my thing, and then suddenly I realize that trying to make a presentation to a bunch of artists is the most intimidating thing I've ever done, because... I suddenly cared a lot about the color, the width of the arrow. I was like, oh my God, these people, like they really know their stuff and they're really going to care. Oh. So, um, so take pity on me, okay? Because um, I wasn't very good in art class. Thank you. Do you like my arrows? Oh. So... We, um, it's interesting, I'm sitting here and, and, you know, we're talking about something different and something purple, and I'm sitting there listening, thinking, you're probably thinking to yourself, pop-ups, that's not new, I've heard about pop-ups, why is that very purple? And so I thought what's really, I guess, unique and remarkable about it is, as you were saying, it's what hits you on the street, uh, and it's what catches you when you're standing there walking down the street you've always walked down, and it's kind of grungy, and, and it's a thing that sort of catches your attention. Uh, and so that's really, um, there. certainly people are doing it all over the world, and, uh, and we absolutely stole it from someone else. But it is true, it's on the ground something that you, and when you see it in your strip, I mean, you're artists, so maybe you, you're used to living in neighborhoods or working in neighborhoods that maybe are a bit gritty. Uh, and when you see something beautiful in the storefront, it's so incredibly fantastic. We started this community association seven years ago. My girlfriend and I started it when we were on maternity leave. You get an, a year's maternity leave here in Canada, so you have a lot of time to push your stroller around. You're clapping? Yeah. It's awesome. You know what's fantastic about it is that this community association is powered by women on maternity leave. And so... Uh, <laughs> Seniors who are sort of retiring and women on maternity leave. And it's funny, except that it actually is changing the community and changing the world. So there's a plug for a year's maternity leave for you. So, but you're pushing your stroller around the neighborhood and you're seeing, and there was nowhere to go for coffee. Like, and the, and the residential space was very wealthy, you know, relatively wealthy. But, but there was nowhere on the commercial strip to buy a coffee. Like, you couldn't push your fancy little $1,500 stroller to buy a coffee anywhere. Not my stroller, but I, there are others. And so we, we started thinking uh, that we really needed to do something about it. So that's what we did. We started around dining room tables, just like all good things start. And we, in the seven years that we've been around, we have a weekly farmer's market in the summer. We have a juried arts fair in the park in September, a regular blog, a walk. And um, the day after Halloween, we bring out all our pumpkins and put them in the park and light them up again. 
We have a community cocktail party, we do murals, we have trees, and we have this business revitalization team. So frustrated with the empty storefronts that we had, we said, what could we do about it? Um, what could we do about empty storefronts? The landlords don't seem that interested in renting them, so what can we do about it? We saw this guy, Marcus Westbury, from uh, Newcastle, Australia. He had this amazing, amazing model. And what they did there was they, they offered up empty storefronts for free to small businesses and artists and community groups and it was a 30-day rolling lease. And so you could go in there for 30 days, and then that lease would just keep rolling over unless somebody else came in and became a paying tenant. The idea was that more, more people, more foot traffic in this strip, then the more, the more action, the more likely there will be people who want to pay and be a paying tenant, and it all just keeps flowing and flowing. So in five years, there now in the top five of Fodor, Fodor's list of great cities to visit because it's got this incredible sort of very artsy, funky, vibrant kind of thing. So we invited him to have dinner with us and we asked him about 5,000 questions about how to do it and then we absolutely copied the model. That was the, that was the arrow that I worked for a long time on there. So we stole it. We stole it all. We took, and you know, you can steal it too, because he's got all the legal documents up there, the insurance, the, all that stuff, it's all up there. So we just stole it. We managed to get a lawyer to take a look at it and sort of figure it out for us, make sure that it was legal here in Canada, here in Ontario. Uh, and we sort of, we just, we just stole it. The best ideas was somebody else's. Our objective was to increase the foot traffic on our main commercial strip with fewer empty storefronts. We tried to do that by filling the empty storefronts with vibrant, inviting, sought-after enterprises, artists, small business, and community groups. Our goal wasn't to incubate businesses. Our goal was to draw foot traffic. So it didn't matter so much to us what you did there as long as it was a great, beautiful window and people wanted to walk by and see it. Step one, find the empty storefronts and encourage the landlords to give us their space for free for at least one month. Well, that seems simple enough, right? Because the place is empty. So why not hand it over to us? You know, we'll put a really great tenant in there and people will start going and like nobody's doing it anyway. So why not, right? I can then, it'll be more vibrant and rents will go up and then someone's going to want to rent that space and like, it's a total no-brainer. It's not a total no-brainer. No, it's hard. It was, like, way, really hard. Landlords, it was hard to get landlords on board. We stalked them. We phoned them a lot. We uh, visited them. We knocked on the door. We would get the greengrocer next door to call us when the guy went in, and then we would run down three blocks, and we would say, Oh, hi! <laughs> I don't know if you got my, my email or my call, uh, but we're doing this pop-up shop, and we thought you'd be... <laughs> Uh, so it was, it, it really was like, um, mag like it was really tough to get them on board. But we were very persistent. We have a few journalists in our group, and they were like dogs with bone. They wouldn't let go of it. Uh, but we did manage to get some landlords on board. So this is, I mean, we, you know, it's a decent neighborhood, but these are some that are particularly looking rough and have been empty for a particularly long time. But these three landlords, they got on board. Then we, as the community association, went in and assessed how much work needs to be done. So what we did, our part in this game, was we went in, we found the landlords, and then we organized volunteers to paint, repair, and clean the space. You can't believe that people would want to spend their Saturday cleaning up, painting some gritty, yucky storefront that stinks. And they absolutely did, because... And I see where those two arrows are. I don't know if you can tell because that's a giant hole. There's a giant hole in the floor, like a big six-foot hole. And we were like, "How are you running a business? How are you running a business here with a giant hole? Like, you have a giant hole?" And they said, "Oh well, we'll just put like some, plat some plat plywood over it or something." And we were like, "No, no, you can't put just put some plywood over it. Like, no." So like we have insurance. Like we're a serious. You know, so. Uh, no, we fixed the giant hole. Although I have to say, one of the artists who came in to look at this space, he was like, can we keep the giant hole? <laughs> <laughs> 
artists. So we did all that space. We cleaned up. We painted. We scrubbed. We got down there trying to scrape the whatever it was off the floor. We did all that kind of stuff. Volunteers, absolutely all volunteers. And the, the reason they like to do it is because that the next time they walk down there, they see that area, they see that space, and they know they did something. And when that space gets rented and there's like a permanent tenant in there, I help to do that. Like, it's a tangible thing that has a real action and response. It's fantastic. Invite vibrant shops to pop in. This is the fun part. The landlord part is the tricky part, but the, the inviting in all the folks is the great part. So we sent out an application. We put it on Kijiji and Craigslist and anywhere we could, and we invited people to come in and uh, give us an application. We, then we sit down, so we re- go through their applications. We did the next, in fact, we were doing it last night for the next round, sitting around drinking wine and reading through the applications. And he said, is it better to be at the beginning of the night or the end of the night? Like, which end of the wine bottle do you want me to be reading your application on? So we, uh, we go through that, and then we invite them in for an interview. And really what we want to know is... Are they going to be there? Like, are they going to show up? Can we kind of trust them to be there? Because the landlord is giving us the space, right? So, like, we really got to make sure that you're not going to wreck the place. And we want to make sure that you can create a great storefront because we've found over the time that that makes the biggest difference. If you can make the storefront look beautiful, people will walk in the door. So we... We bring them in, we meet them. The pro- my problem when I meet them is that I fall in love with all of them and I want to get all of them in and we're trying to like go through these crazy calisthenic logistics to try and figure out, oh, couldn't we find one more spot for this guy? I really like this guy. What about this guy? We try and get folks who, can, who will draw people in and who will increase foot traffic because that was always our goal was foot traffic. And they came and they were awesome. So these are some of the people that popped in. People popped in and put out their stuff, and they set it up. We told them they couldn't put holes in the wall. Like, they were fantastic, fantastic. They made it beautiful. Like, it was amazing to us, and it was amazing to people who would walk by that that place, that place that I've been walking by for years and looks grungy and terrible, and God knows what was going on inside it, is this. It was absolutely fabulous. We promoted it as much as we possibly could. We, we pulled every favor we could. We got on the radio, we got on TV, we got in the local paper, we got, we got everywhere we could, we talked about it. Talk, 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 talk. And I have to say the hard, and I mean, you guys probably know this better than me, but the hardest part about this program is that it was pretty easy to get pr- promo for it the first time. And it was, it was okay the second round, And the third round, it's getting harder. And the fourth round, it's getting harder. Because now it's not new, right? Uh, But we we absolutely need to do the promo to get people out to the pop-up shops and once they're there. So that is a challenge for sure. But um, we absolutely have to promote the heck out of it. We had events. You know, one of the really great things that happened was neighboring businesses kind of jumped on board and organized events so that they could all, like, be part of it. Uh, So that sort of took a bit of the work off us, but we did a lot of sort of marketing and promoting locally to try and uh, get people out. Look at these guys. How cute are they? They named their children after Superman, Superman characters, Kalal and Corral or something. Uh, Anyway, they are an absolute success. So they've popped, they popped in, they were doing a home-based business out of their basement. They did one month and two months with us. And now they're permanent in that space. They moved in upstairs. They've got their custom T-shirt company running out of the business now. Um, she, her goal was to not go back to work after her second baby, so she's not going back to work. They're making this their business. And we have another populated storefront. 17 shops so far. We're working on June. June is coming up, and we're going we're gonna to start adding to that number. Eight storefronts revitalized. Again, we're doing a few more in June. Three storefronts rented long-term, so three that are sort of off the market that are now long-term rentals. 83% of neighboring storefronts say pop-ups increased their foot traffic. Six new businesses on the Strip. Not bad. We only started in October. So that's my story. What was really great, so I just, you know, particularly, I'll I'll mention when we had um, artists in the space, 
Uh, we got lots of great, great feedback. There was a real interest in supporting those artists and those businesses that were supporting us. So there was this very serious sort of reciprocal feeling among shoppers who were, if you are going to come in here and you're going to sort of try and support our commercial strip, our neighborhood, you're going to commit to us and you're going to be open and you're going to be in there, we're going to support you too. So there was, what was, what's really lovely is that sort of connection, that feeling that I feel kind of responsible for your success. So I, as a shopper, feel responsible for your success. I'm grateful that you're here in my neighborhood. You're grateful that I'm in your shop. Um, so I think that's the, the real value that we've seen, the really kind of cool thing that we've seen in the pop-ups is the, is the kind of connections that people are making to the people who are making and selling their product. So thank you. We have five minutes for questions for Natasha. So if you have a question, please step up to the mic at the central part of the aisle here. I have a question to start. Natasha? Yes. Uh, what, was the, what was the revenue model? Did the people who occupy the pop-up shop, did they have to pay any rent at all? And do you have any like uh, funds that you can work with for your expenses for the renovation? Yeah, so we... Um so the first round, and that's what I was talking about here, they didn't have to pay anything. You know, the thing about the model that we followed was apparently in Australia, there were some differences. Apparently in Australia, they don't worry that much about things like the cost of heat. So when we were in, no, and we were in December and we had six pop-ups running and the landlords kept talking to us about heat and heat, what about the price of heat and everything? And uh, we went back to the guy in, in Australia and was like, what did you guys do about heat? you know, paying for the heat. And he just was like, what? <laughs> we were like, oh, yeah, I guess that's not such a big deal. So uh, we ended up asking uh, in the next round for them to pay a fee for it to cover heat. And I'll tell you something. The, we're actually sort of, so this was the model that we followed. This is what we're using. Starting in June, we're experimenting with a new model, which is kind of an increased rental model. The reason we're doing it is because, like I said, it was hard to get the landlords on board. We did get some, and and it's been successful, but they are not really willing to do more than one or two at the most months. So this sort of ongoing six-month lease, rolling lease, they're not interested in. They want to know that there's going to be like someone down the line. Uh, so we've had to change our model a little bit um, just because of the, the place where we're at in terms of the landlords. Uh, so we're, just, we're adapting along the way to see, if we can, to see how we can make it work in the place where we are. I have a, a question as well. You said it's getting more and more difficult to promote as, as it's moving along. Could you be a little bit more specific about the avenues you've chosen to promote it? We, I mean, the great thing, and actually we were talking about it a little bit earlier, was we had built up, so within the community association, we had built up a blog, you know, just a newsletter, that went out to about 800 people in the neighborhood, and so, and we've been building that and building that and building that. So that's by far our most powerful tool, because the people who pay attention to that blog live in the neighborhood. It's a finite group of people who care about the things that go on between this block and this block, but they care a lot. So they're very engaged on what they're going to do with that information. They're going to take action. Uh, so definitely our most powerful piece of uh, promotion was through our ongoing existing communications tool to the people in the neighborhood. Because like I said, they took a real sense of pride in the people who were going to do pop-ups. Otherwise, we, um, we, we put out news releases and we called people up. We tried to get lots of as much earned media as we could. Uh, we put it out, like I say, on Kijiji and all, any kind of free uh, website that we could. We did, uh, we got, vol- I mean, the beautiful part about being a residence association is we have an incredible number of graphic artists and designers and those kind of folks that we can call on and say, okay, like, can you, um, you know, can you design us an incredible poster? Uh, and we had people who just gave us a ton of like design help in particular, uh, and we put out you know posters and booklets, and we did just everything we could possibly think of. And so now, because like I say, we've kind of gone to the mainstream media and our local community media, um, we're reaching out 
to um, like architecture trade magazines, developer trade magazines, uh, those kind of um, urban planning kind of more technical places. So we're trying to go a little bit further afield. But word of mouth, right? Put it on your Facebook page, you know? Like we ask all our folks, put it on your Facebook page, get, invite all your friends. Um, it's, it's old school marketing, but it's the best kind. You fixed up their places, holes, painted, repaired, and everything, and you couldn't leverage that for more than a month or two because surely that must have had a value to those landlords for an empty storefront that was, oh, it must be decaying if it's not being used. So isn't that, can, can you use that in leveraging time with them for this pop-up on a, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about it, right? It's not like they're getting nothing, absolutely. I mean, we were in there scrubbing the floors, painting the walls. Like, we went down to those washrooms in the basement, um, and we painted them, and they were yucky. Like, really. And we fixed the giant hole in the floor. No, we thought it would be. We thought it would be enough. And, uh, and certainly in other places that have followed this model, it was enough. Times are tough, I think. Probably uh, the economic situation in, you know, in the world has something to do with it. Yeah, no, I would, I would fully agree that that should be enough, <laughs> absolutely. Hi, Patricia Medea um, from Pratt Institute and also a working studio jeweler. So my question, I have two questions, and they're kind of related. One is for um, Natasha. Uh, you spoke a lot about the return of this project for the communities, and I was sort of curious about what the return was for the participating artists. Were those experiences lucrative for them as well, um, in terms of sales, et cetera? Uh, so thanks. We worked very hard to try and get as many people in the door as possible. So the other thing we do is we run a farmer's market. And again, the goal of a farmer's market is not necessarily to get people eating you know, strawberries and stuff. It's really about a community event. But the community event doesn't happen if the farmers don't make money. So by the same token, this whole pop-up shop thing doesn't work for our goals, which is, which is the community development, if the folks who are behind the counter don't make money. So our whole, all of that marketing, all of that sort of trying to get people out, get people foot, feet in the door, is all about trying to make sure that those people are making money. Sometimes, and sometimes it's been successful and sometimes it hasn't. Uh, one of the businesses has... Um, is set up uh, is a permanent shop. So there's the one that I showed you that's a permanent shop. There's another one that sells jewelry and art and sort of more gift type stuff. They've also done, made a permanent shop, so they've also got a permanent space. And there's another one of our pop-ups that's, that's trying to find a space on there too. So if people want, you know, if they're working to try and make it a success, you've, we provide this pretty incredible team of volunteers who are volunteers in this space but professionals doing all this kind of professional work in their regular day job who want you to succeed like you wouldn't believe. So we, we got like a team of people who are working night and day for free for you to make your business work. What is the price point? We, so we had uh, a jewel, some jewelers come in and apply whose stuff was more in the $200, $300 range we didn't think that they would be able to make it. So it was, even though it was Christmas, and we thought, you know, we were, we were nervous about them sort of giving up their Christmas time to sort of, it was December, we were nervous about, uh, we didn't think they'd be able to sort of sell on that price point. We do, a, we do an arts fair in the fall, and so we, ha we have a bit of a sense of, um, of what the price point is. So that's going to increase, certainly, but... But we try to, our, our, what we're trying to do is make sure that we match the space and the, and the applicant. So we go to great pains to say it's not that we don't like you and it's not we don't think your stuff is great. But we want, like, it's really important for us for this to be successful. So we, we really are trying to make the shop a success. One of the things we do, we do this weekly market and we have a kid's fun thing there, you know, and they, like, paint their face. And we have people who come in and do, like, they say, oh, can I, you know, do a workshop for you guys this week? Like, and we go, oh, yeah, yeah. So then they came in, and then we have a relationship with them. And like I said, we have a very small readership, but incredibly loyal and act takes action. 
and especially when they're local, because everything, like, local is the new black, right? Like, so we, you know, like, when, so the people I know in my neighborhood, I'm delighted to, I'm delighted to shop with the people in my neighborhood. Like, I will pay, you know, more money because I believe in supporting my local whatever, right? Um, and we got to know those people because they offered to come and do a workshop or do a thing for the kids or, you know, sort of, they wanted to be part of it. So we've certainly learned a lot about a lot of the artists in our community by the, when they've sort of come out and offered to kind of be part of it and do something. This concludes the lecture by Natasha Granistein titled The Unexpected Purple Cow, Pop-Up Stores and Alternative Exhibition Spaces from the 2013 SNAG Professional Development Seminar titled Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow. There are five additional presentations with recorded audio. An introduction to Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow by the organizers Andy Cooperman, Bridget Martin, and myself, Harriet Estelle Berman. Purple Cow documentation via video and photography by Rachel Timmons. Bringing the Purple Cow to Market, Tapping into the Experience Economy by Laura Bazant. Justin Hartsman and Jeremy Pariah from the All You Can Eat website guys speak about customizing the cow, new trends in cross-platform web optimization. Fashion editor Michelle Biladu speaks about 10 tips for catching and keeping an editor's attention. All of these presentations were from the SNAG Professional Development Seminar that takes place each year during the SNAG Conference. The presentation sponsors are SNAG, the Society of North American Goldsmiths, and MJSA, Manufacturing Jewelers and Suppliers of America. Look for all six presentations from Sacred Cow, Purple Cow, Cash Cow, on the Professional Development Seminar page. There are two locations, and the links are very long, so this slide has two tiny URLs for finding this information. There are 21 slide presentations with audio from past Professional Development Seminars, in addition to a selection of handouts. This information is available for the arts and crafts community from the Professional Development Seminar found on the SNAG website and my website. Ask Harriet offers additional material on many of the topics developed during the PDS. Contact me anytime with comments, questions, or suggestions for future Professional Development Seminar topics.